Goffman's idea of identity is kind of similar to Butler's in the sense that he sees identity as a performance. So it's not like a stable uh, and independent essence that just uh, inherently belongs to a person. It's a contingent, uh, ongoing, active process uh, that depends on um, the, the audience that the performer is performing for and uh, the specific setting, you know, the stage that they're performing on. Metaphorically, of course, it's not like a literal stage that you're always physically on when you're interacting. All these things, all these aspects, all these factors kind of determine what role you're playing as an actor in any given social situation. So basically, whenever we enter into the social presence of others, whenever we're in front of others in some sort of public way, uh, we seek to present our best selves the best version of ourselves, the best image of ourselves, and uh, make a good impression on the people we're with uh, based on a number of considerations, their personal expectations of us, general societal expectations of what's appropriate, and uh, the context of the specific situation you're in. All these things, all these considerations are kind of consciously or sometimes subconsciously at play uh, in your head as you're operating, as you're acting, as you're performing in a social situation. And vice versa, the people you're with, the people you're performing in front of us or are in front of are also performing in their own right. Uh, so it's a mutual kind of performer audience relationship where you see yourself as the performer and everyone else in the circle as part of the audience, but they each see themselves as performers and they see you as a fellow audience member that they're performing for. So there's already all sorts of dynamics going on where they are trying to seek information from you or about you. They're trying to get to know what you're all about if they don't know you already. If you haven't built up an established reputation with them, they can maybe scrutinize your conduct or your body language or whatever to try to glean clues about who you are or what you're about, uh, You know your appearance, how you're dressed, how you carry yourself. And of course, they're also using contextual clues around them, uh, the setting that you're both in. So let's say you're hanging out at a skate park and someone approaches you. You might automatically assume, okay, they're at a skate park. Therefore, due to the setting, they must be a skateboarder. And then you can kind of start scrutinizing what they're wearing. Like, are they wearing skater clothes? Are they carrying a skateboard? Uh, do they have the body language of a skateboard, like do they look comfortable in this situation? And all these things, like I said, consciously and subconsciously uh, build to form an impression of the person we're interacting with. And that person is consciously or subconsciously trying to present a certain image of themselves. So they may be trying to assert themselves as the most knowledgeable or the best skateboarder and like, you know, a pro and they belong there. So in every situation, we have our own motives and objectives that we're trying to achieve, uh, either directly or indirectly, or consciously, like we're aware of it before we even enter the situation where we want to get out of it. And then other times, uh, it's less at the forefront of our minds, uh, but still uh, at the back of our heads about what we want to pursue through our interactions. And, you know, by it, we achieve what we want. Uh, through managing the impression of others, the impression that others have of us, and uh, maybe even managing the conduct of others, how they react to us. So as soon as I mentioned conduct, you know there's a bit of a Foucauldian aspect here, all the, the micro power dynamics we were talking about, the whole basketball analogy is fully at play in any given conversation. There's all sorts of strategy going on. You may be involved in a conversation for the express purpose of like wanting others to think highly of you uh, or you want others to think that you think highly of them and that you respect them or you know you're trying to get something from them like information or and something or you know establish yourself with a certain status within that group uh, but regardless of the intention we have in mind our motives in any given situation uh, it's always in our best interest to have exert some sort of control uh, over the situation, often subtly, right? Because like we were talking about power, you don't want it to be this obviously oppressive thing, uh, especially in a conversation where everyone has the you know the freedom to leave. If they're not interested in the conversation or they, they don't like it, they're not comfortable with it. So it's a fine line. It's a delicate balance between 
holding on tightly and letting go lightly to the kinds of power flows you're engaging in in a conversation. So this is where framing comes in. Like you can exert some power in framing a certain situation and priming how others can potentially respond to us, you know, structuring their field of potential action uh, as a receiver uh, in, in your conversation. So I have a quote from Goffman here, and he says that we can say that a social role will involve one or more parts and that each of these different parts may be presented by the performer on a series of occasions to the same kinds of audiences or to an audience of the same person. So in every interaction, it's a different audience or it's the same audience, in which case you would act consistently. But think about the different social situations you find yourself in on an, every, on an everyday basis and the different audiences you perform for and how differently you act in front of each audience. So I think we can all relate to the idea of acting differently in front of our parents or our work bosses compared to how we behave in the company of our closest friends. So there are many uh, profanities and uh, topics uh, of conversation that you would indulge in perhaps uh, when just speaking casually with your friends uh, that you wouldn't ever dare uh, introduce in the polite co company of your parents or your bosses. Same thing if you're at work, if you're in a cu customer service position, uh, your, your your audience is the customer in that sense and, and probably your boss and coworkers too. So you have to perform with that in mind. And like I said, your performance in front of that audience will be very different from how you perform and act outside of work once you clock out for the day and move away from that stage and onto another one. So, uh, we present the first impression of ourselves. First impressions are very important uh, because that's the impression that we then commit to. Like I said, once you have the same audience, a uh, series of interactions, uh, you know, you have a relationship where you're going to see this person or this audience uh, on multiple occasions. Uh, you want to set the standard. You know, you want to get off on the right foot by making a good, a strong first impression, and then with minor additions and modifications made to this initial uh, informational state over the course of future interactions between participants. And again, there needs to be some consistency, some cohesiveness. If you act completely differently every single time you meet with the same person or groups of person uh, people, it's not only going to ruin the first impression that you made, but they're not going to know what to expect of you. There's no continuation of self. It would be like trying to watch a show, but every week the characters are completely different and the settings are completely different. Uh, you're probably going to stop watching that show because it's not, it doesn't make sense. It's not coherent. So not only are our first impressions important, but continuing to build along uh, the line of treatment that you introduce uh, through your initial impressions. So you know what they say, first impressions are lasting impressions. And you only get one chance to make a good first impression with someone. So depending on the relationship, like it's someone you're going to have a lot of interactions with, then it's important to make a good one. If it's someone you're never going to see again, then it's less important. But yeah, that first impression very much sets the standard. So if you introduce yourself uh, to a new group of friends and you introduce yourself as like the one everyone makes fun of, like the clown, the one, ev the, the butt of everyone's jokes, uh, then it's going to be hard to uh, gain respect later on down the line and uh, be taken seriously by that group in the future if you've already set that standard with your first impression. Uh, so I don't know about you, but I can be quite terrible at first impressions. I just have really bad luck when it comes to that. Uh, the universe just conspires against me sometimes. Um, for example my supervisor like that's a super important relationship right like the grad student supervisor relationship and just through a series of unfortunate events i always tended especially early on to make gaffes uh and faux pas in front of my supervisor uh just due to bad luck and bad timing it just led to a lot of uh cringeworthy and awkward uh initial interactions so for example uh, he temporarily had a cane, which I had forgotten about, and we were sitting down talking. And then we get up, we stand up, and I go to shake his hand, but I totally forgot that he has a cane that he needs to like, lean on with his right hand as he's standing up. So I'm just standing there like a 
goof with my hand out, you know, expecting a handshake, and he clearly can't shake my hand, so... You know, I was just awkwardly left hanging there, and still to this day, I think about stuff like this, and every interaction I have, even though he's probably completely forgotten about it, I feel like I need to overcome those poor first impressions that I think he still has of me. So again, some Foucauldian aspects on how we act based on how we think others might see us, or how we think others uh, might want to see us. So there's uh, aspects of self-surveillance and self monitoring and self-control and self-discipline at play in every interaction we have as we already know but it's a bit less depressing than the Foucauldian power we're talking about in week three because this one feels like we're more active parts and participants in these power relations like we're we're living in active sites of power we're conduits of power and it you know we can direct its flows uh, so we can actively change existing power relations within micro-level conversations due to just how fluid and dynamic they are. So we can exert control over a situation by uh, influencing how that situation is defined by others. So structuring the definition of the situation so that other people see things the way you want them to. Again, it's all more subtle than that. You're not forcing anything or foisting anything uh, on someone, you're trying to just subtly frame the situation to engender certain kinds of uh, impressions to emerge so that people kind of voluntarily act in accordance with your own plans. So you're kind of indirectly directing their activities in ways that will uh, produce and convey uh, a favorable impression of you that works in your best interest. So again, it's that whole notion of uh, truth that Foucault espouses. Like, you're not trying to shape reality. You're not trying to structure their experience of reality. Uh, but if everyone in a group sees things the same way and acts accordingly and thinks uh, approximately the same way and has the same impression of what's going on, uh, then they're going to act as if it's the reality of the situation. So for all intents and purposes, within the confines of that group dynamic, it may as well be reality. It may as well be truth. So like I said, this is all subtle. You kind of uh, signify certain social characteristics that uh, you think are desirable and will be recognized by others as worthy of desire or respect or whatever you're trying to attain within that group. You're trying to project yourself as a person of a particular type or status that merits an expectation of certain treatment. So you're trying to set the standard for how others can and will and should treat you within that interaction. So think about your bosses or think about other authority figures in your everyday life, uh, like religious figures, like priests or your professors even. Like within those relationships, those authority figures expect to be afforded a certain treatment, a certain kind of treatment. And they'll do things, they'll act in a certain way, they'll talk in a certain way that elicit that kind of treatment. Kind of obliging others uh, to, to value them and to treat them in that intended way. So again, I don't mean to make everything Foucauldian, but it's trying to naturalize the, um, the hierarchies or the power inequalities that are at play in a social interaction or a conversation. So it's not trying to, it's trying to conceal the fact that these are artificial relationships, that your boss is just a guy or a girl who was promoted to that position and given that and put in that position they're not naturally superior than you in any way same thing with the priest or professor but due to everything else due to all the elements in that interaction the setting the performance the the standards the expectations uh that artificial aspect is kind of concealed and forgotten about and then you, you kind of just react naturally to these authority figures when you're interacting with them so not everything goes according to plan. You know, the best laid plans of mice and men, something, something. I forgot the rest of that quote, but they go awry sometimes. Everyone has a plan until it goes wrong and, and things can and will go wrong. So we're trying in any given situation to like steer the conversation and the interaction in ways that accentuate certain aspects of ourselves that we want to promote and then concealing other aspects of ourselves that are less glamorous that we don't want to divulge to others. So we try to protect our image and buffer it from 
revelations that could contradict the, like I said, the first impression that you made, the image that you're trying to cultivate within a group. So your boss is going to accentuate all the things that emphasize the fact that he is in power and he deserves or demands a certain uh, standard of treatment. But he's not going to tell you or they're not going to tell you that uh, they struck out on a first date last weekend or they're having digestive issues this morning. Like they're, th those things go against the strong impression that they're trying to make. So they'll certainly conceal those aspects and uh, promote the ones that work in their favor. But like I said, things happen uh, within the process, uh, within the unfolding of a conversation. Uh, which could contradict or discredit or otherwise throw doubt upon the projection that we're trying to make of ourselves. So the performer may slip up. Uh, they may reveal that they don't have as much knowledge or capability as they propound. They may act uh, inappropriate or improper, uh, maybe unprofessional if they're claiming to be professional in a certain uh, circumstance. They may do something that kind of warrants disrespect or um, evokes or expresses disrespect. Um, so yeah, someone may trip and fall, like literally trip and fall. And, you know, of course, you're going to lose face uh, in a situation like that. Or you may uh, slip up. You may have a slip of the tongue and say something wrong. Or you may burp or yawn or have some sort of lapse in judgment uh, that goes against the impression that you're trying to foster in the minds of others. Could lead to confusion on your audience's behalf because they didn't expect that from you. Could lead to a bit of embarrassment on your behalf because you've lost face. You need to do something to save face and to uh, reclaim your reputation. Because all these things, all these uh, weaknesses, all these flaws that uh, accidentally emerge uh, weaken your ability to define the situation on your terms. All of a sudden you're giving your power away. So you may have propped yourself up as an authority figure in a certain uh, area, but then you could lose it all in a second if you uh, slip up in ways that you now appear differently, arguably worse in some ways than um, you initially projected through your first impression and the impression that you try to build and maintain through subsequent interactions. Yeah, so there's all sorts of involuntary, inadvertent uh, ways of acting that you don't mean to do, but certainly they pop up. We're all human. Sometimes it's not things that are through no fault of your own. Like let's say you're a political figure, highly revered, highly respected, giving a speech out in public, uh, you know, outdoors somewhere, and then a bird flies by and poops on your shoulder, and now you got bird poop all over your shoulder. Uh, that's going to reflect poorly on you even though you didn't do anything wrong in that situation. So sometimes it can't be helped. And in those situations, you got to save face. You got to rebuild your reputation. It sometimes helps to just point out what happened to kind of um, release the tension. Maybe laugh at yourself a little bit so that you're laughing with others instead of others laughing at you if you find yourself in an embarrassing situation. Or just own it in some way that restores your confidence and gives you back your power over the situation. Kind of move away from the embarrassing incident that proved you are human and you are fallible and try to rebuild and reinstitute yourself as infallible. So like I said, well, as we were talking about with the, um, the acting, the theater analogy, this would be akin to a breaking character, like an actor who uh, is supposed to be like in a serious drama and then all of a sudden they like burst out laughing and it's like an outtake. Uh, and it, it just takes you out of it as an audience member. So these are inopportune moments uh, that kind of intrude upon the image and the performance that you're trying to foster. And it shows people aspects of yourself uh, or the situation that you didn't want others to see. Again, these are the aspects that you wanted to conceal in favor of other aspects of yourself that you wanted to promote. So... Beyond these embarrassing instances that are inevitable, uh, when everyone in the situation has approximately uh, agreed to share the same definition of what's taking place, uh, they've achieved a temporary uh, and always, you know, unstable working consensus. So it doesn't just 
fix everything into place, uh, but all participants have um, tentatively agreed as to what their conversation and their interactions and the meanings and values in that conversation uh, consist of. So it defines that interaction, that situation, that conversation in a single way, in a singular overall definition of the situation. So maybe like in a, in a situation between two friends at lunch, uh, the, uh, a working consensus forms that, okay, this lunch is to um, form a, um, a reciprocal show of affection for each other, respect for each other, uh, concern for the other one's well-being. All these things are established uh, through the course of the conversation, and that forms the, the working consensus, the shared definition of what's going on in that situation. Or like service occupations, um, there's a working consensus there of the expectations that the customer has of the, the customer service worker and vice versa. So the customer expects the worker to uh, help solve their problem, uh, but maintain a disinterested involvement in the problem of the client. Because it would be kind of off-putting if all of a sudden the person, the customer service representative you're talking to on the phone uh, gets really personally and emotionally invested in your problem that you're reporting to them. Uh, and then vice versa, like the, the worker expects you to have, to show a modicum of, you know, respect uh, for the competence and capabilities of the worker. So these are the kind of uh, tentative, uh, tenuous, temporary working consensuses, consensi that are formed and established uh, within any given interaction in any given setting, depending on who the participants are and uh, just what the context of that interaction is. So, as performers, because we all are social actors uh, when we're acting socially, uh, we cycle through various masks in our everyday performances. Not the mask you think I'm talking about, not the mask we've been wearing for about a year now. I'm talking about metaphorical masks. Uh, and each mask entails specific ways of conducting yourself. So like I said, the mask you wear uh, as an obedient uh, ch uh, child of your parents uh, will cause you to censor yourself. It'll be a much more uh, restrained role that you're playing. Uh, the mask will uh, fit a lot more tighter. And uh, like I said, that mask we taken off and cycled and switched with another mask when you're with your friends. Uh, and you can do a lot more uh, or, you know, cycled again and now you're an employee. You wear a different mask uh, in, that sen in, that ca in that context when you're serving customers. So Goffman says, um, insofar as this mask represents the conception we have formed of ourself, i.e. the role we are stri striving to live up to, the mask is our truer self, the self that we would like to be that we would like to uh, pro project to others. And then eventually our conception of our role becomes second nature and an integral part of our personality. We come into the world as biological individuals and achieve characters and then become persons. We become citizens. We become members of a culture through the adoption of these social masks. So as human beings, we are creatures of various shifting uh, moods and impulses and energies that change from one moment to the next. But when it comes to being characters that we portray for an audience, the mask that we put on, uh, like I said, there needs to be more consistency. There can't be as many ups and downs or variations in our behavior. We have uh, a standard of expectation that we've set for ourselves and for others, and we have to live up to those. Again, it's self-discipline. You're constraining yourself uh, to act in a certain way and to hopefully be seen in a certain way by others. And then these masks that we put on become part of us. Once you play a character for so long, you may tend to forget what parts are the mask and what parts are you. And the line is blurred and then they become, for all intents and purposes, one and the same. It's like that saying that I introduced, I think in week two, uh, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to see it, then it didn't really fall. So the same thing with your social being. If you are a certain way, but no one's there to ever experience it because you're always wearing a mask that says otherwise, then is it? Does it exist then empirically? 
like your social existence is defined by how others see see you. So if you're always wearing a mask in your social existence, then that's you. Like if you spend eight hours of the day working and then eight hours of the day being a diligent uh, husband or wife or parent, and then the other eight hours sleeping, then that's essentially two masks that you're wearing most of your waking life. Uh, and that's going to form a large part and it's going to integrate with a large part of your character. So it's a character that you portray, but it also begins to characterize you. So that leads to the question, is there a true self ever, or are we always performing? Like if you're by yourself, are you any more truer to yourself then than you are when you're in front of others? Because in those moments, you're the tree in the forest. No one's around to see you. Your only socially validated existence is through those masks that you don. And we get so good at these routines that we put on, that we perform for others, uh, that we can make it seem like it's our only routine, like it's what we're all about. Um, the audience begins to assume that the character projected before them is all that there is to the individual who acts out that projection for them. So again, many professions where this is the case, where they make you feel special, as if your interaction with them is the most genuine, intimate, personal, uh, like the first time they've ever had such an interaction. Like we'll get to it in the week on nightlife, but let's say uh, a bartender can very much facilitate this uh, contrived genuineness and spontaneousness where they're like, hey buddy, I'll, let me tell you a story. I've never told anyone this before, but I trust you. Or hey, let me give you a free, free drink on the house because I like you. Like, do you really think you're the first person that they ever treated that way? They probably just want a big tip. But through their performance, they can add a personal touch to make it seem like that interaction is wholly unique just between you and them. Goffman mentions how you might feel a slight disappointment when like you have a friendship with someone and you think that friendship is really special, like you have inside jokes that no one else shares, like you, you two just click in a way that no one else could. And then you see that friend interact with other friends and you realize like, oh, they do that with everyone. Like I'm not special in that regard. They have inside jokes with other people. All of their other actions seem just as intimate and just as unique as the ones that you thought were intimate and unique with them. Like I said, this, the sincerity, the self-awareness of these performances is a bit ambiguous. Sometimes we come to believe the act we are engaging in to the point where we're convinced that that's the real us, the true self. And then other times we are very aware that we're putting on an act. And this can change over time. Like you can first adopt a mask uh, artificially, like very obviously, like you're very aware that this isn't you. But then over time, if everyone believes the act that you're putting on and uh, reinforces it and gives you confidence, uh, then you could start to believe it. You know, maybe like a preacher or something, like someone who just starts out preaching, who's like, I'm not sure if this is for me. Like, I don't feel uh, like I have any powers here. But then over the years, like everyone in the audience is eating it up. They love the preacher. They're showing so much reverence and respect for them. And then the preacher over time just believes that, oh man, I got the power of God on my side. And they feel less and less like they're tricking or deluding their audience and they believe what they're saying and fully believe in their abilities. Uh, and then vice versa, there are examples where someone first believes everything about their performance, but then over time they become more cynical and realize that it's just a mask that they're putting on for a certain situation to uh, to reach a certain end. Uh, so this slide kind of outlines the, um, the stages that we're looking at, the whole uh, environment in which these performances take place. So at the forefront, we have the front stage, uh, and that includes the social front. So that's the, uh, the setting that we find ourselves in. And uh, in addition, the personal front, so our appearance and our manner. So all this on the front stage is the observable part of the performance, the part that can be seen by the audience. Setting is the scene in which the actor performs. And again, it's not a physical stage. It's everything around you in that context. So the furniture, the decor, the physical layout, other background items, which uh, supply the scenery and stage props. 
uh, for the human action that you are then performing. So think of a State of the Union address that the president delivers and how they're doing it within the Oval Office and they have that ins the presidential insignia on the front of the carpet and the big uh, oak desk and the American flag in the background. Uh, that's all this. That's all the setting that's being uh, structured in a certain way to uh, maximize the effectiveness of that performance by the president and to send a message and make an impression through environmental factors without having to explicitly say everything. Like in that case, the president doesn't even need to say, I'm the president. They just say, good evening. Welcome to the, the State of the Union address. Because all the environmental cues uh, cue the, the audience in to what to expect. Same thing with like a doctor's office and all the, the signifiers that are at play within a doctor's office that kind of cue you into acting and reacting a certain way and to receive the performance in a certain way. Uh, as the patient, you are the audience for the, the doctor's performance as the doctor. And the stage, the setting is literally the doctor's office. And of course, things can go wrong in this area too. Like I said, there can be mistakes and slip ups and accidents, uh, not necessarily on behalf of the individual, the actor, it could be things happening in your setting. Maybe something falls down, like during the State of the Union address, imagine if in the background, the, the flag just falls over. Uh, that's not going to reflect well upon the president in that case. Then the second part of the front stage, uh is the appearance so that is literally how you physically appear as a performer to your audience so this of course uh denotes your clothes your your sex your age uh your size uh all these physical characteristics your looks your posture the way you speak your facial expressions your body language all of these factors uh determine and influence how you come off how you appear to others. And this is what others associate you with. So again, um, the president will be wearing probably a blue suit, red tie, like we've mentioned the week on fashion, or the doctor will be wearing their uh, pristine white lab coat with uh, the stethoscope hanging off the neck. They may be carrying a chart uh, in their arm. Like all these things are things you come to expect from those positions. Those are the costumes of that uh, performance. So it's the clothing, uh, the equipment that you use in that uh, situation, your style, uh, you know, your, your posture, all those, those aspects contribute to your appearance. And then secondly, we have manner. And that's just the way you carry yourself, the way you conduct yourself. Uh, that kind of clues the audience in to uh, what to expect from the oncoming situation. So again, the president's manner would be presidential. You know, he'd act presidentially and then the doctor would also act very professionally and uh, knowledgeably. If your doctor walked in in jeans and a t-shirt, then their appearance would be inappropriate for the performance. They'd be out of costume. And then if the doctor walked in and was really uh, unprofessional or rude or aggressive or just like, I don't know what you got. I've never seen that before. Then their manner would be incompatible with the performance that they're supposed to be acting out in that situation. So those three aspects, the setting, the appearance, and the manner combine to form the front stage of our social interactions, the stuff that the public can see or others can see, the part that's visible to the audience and are part of the official performance. But then there's also the backstage. And again, backstage is both physical and mental it could be backstage behavior you know the way you behave when no one is watching when there's no audience uh, present so the backstage is where any aspects of ourself that we don't want to display in public are uh, suppressed you know it's the stuff that kind of swept under the rug so that you can present a, a clean image uh, so like i said it's both a mental place uh, you know, your behaviors uh, like daydreaming would be a backstage uh, operation or like it could be a physical place too, like a break room uh, in, in a workplace or a, the kitchen in a restaurant where you're not in front of the customers where you can kind of let your hair down. Well, don't don't let your hair down when you're in a kitchen. You don't want hairs to get anywhere. But you know, what I mean, you kind of kick your feet up a little bit and act more casually where you're not having to actively play a role for others or keep up appearances. So you can use the analogy of plumbing 
Like plumbing is in every modern building you enter, but you never see it. You never see all these necessary pipes that are transferring water and other stuff uh, throughout the building because they don't want you to see it. You know, that's kind of the less glamorous aspect that isn't the focus of what that building is trying to present itself as to you. It's so, like I said, it serves a very important, a necessary in integral function, but it's designed to remain hidden from plain view. So backstage is where you can take off the mask they've been donning all day and, uh, you know, break out of character. All those ex expectations that the audiences have of you, you don't have to maintain them when you're backstage. Again, it could be a physical place or it could be a mental place. So a customer service representative, they could be presenting all the right things to you in terms of their professionalism and their conduct, all the front stage things, but in the back of their head, they may be daydreaming about, oh, I just want to finish work today and go to the cottage, or I really don't want to help this client right now, or things that could, could ruin the performance if they snuck out of the backstage. But as long as they're not visible or perceivable by the audience, then it's safe for the actor to kind of uh, find a reprieve and a respite by indulging in these backstage uh, thoughts and behaviors. So again, the kitchen example at a restaurant is a great uh, demonstration of how differently people act, like uh, a waiter or a server could um, act completely differently when they're in front of the customer serving them. And as soon as they go back behind the, the curtain or the counter, uh, to their buddies in the kitchen, then all of a sudden they're slagging each other and yelling and maybe going outside for a smoke break, maybe speaking in a different language if you know English is their second language that they need to speak in public, but then when they're with their buddies, they can get more comfortable. You know, we can get a bit sloppy. We can uh, let our guards down a little bit when we're backstage and just relax for a bit because maintaining a performance constantly can be... A lot of pressure and we may need to step out of character at times and just be a bit less uh, formal and indulge in more informalities so we can finally summarize uh the elements that goffman considers uh important to uh any given performance so first you need belief in the part that one's playing this isn't always necessary but of course it's important to a, a good performance a credible believable performance uh that comes off as sincere you know it helps if you believe uh what you're saying and what you're performing as if you don't then it could come off to the audience as insincere and kind of you know break character that way and then secondly you need the mask you know the front that's the thing you put on so that the audience knows what you're performing as what to expect from you and what you use to control their expectations and the definition of the situation. Uh, so yeah, we all put on various masks throughout our lives, not just the long term of our lives, but in our everyday life. On any given daily basis, we are cycling through various masks. And then we have dramatic realization. So this is the parts of the performance that the, um, the actor is trying to impress upon the audience, that the, um, the actor is trying to emphasize and highlight maybe exaggerate you know the parts that they want to stress to, to the audience uh the parts that they want to hit home so that the audience remembers so when you're going on a first date the things that you mention to your date are often the dramatic realization you know the parts that you want to emphasize about yourself or a more literal example like what you put on your resume and then fourthly we have idealization wherein the performer tries to present an idealized view of the situation, like a perfect scenario, uh, just to avoid potential misrepresentation. Again, those potential embarrassments that could pop up or misunderstandings. Like audiences and societies in general have uh, an idea of what a given situation should entail and should look like. And the performers try to uh, live out that idea uh, you know, try to carry out the performance according to that idea. So that's the idealization uh, that occurs through that. And then fifthly, you have maintenance of expressive control. So the need to stay in character, uh, you know, the performance has to make sure that they're sending out the correct signals and that nothing's getting lost in translation. And then making sure that they're, 
they're repressing things that they don't want to express that they don't want to get out there in front of the audience so it's about controlling what you're expressing and how you're expressing it so as to maximize the impression that you're trying to make and then minimize anything that may detract from that impression and then sixthly you have misrepresentation that's you know uh, when you convey the wrong message um, the audience doesn't believe in the role that you're playing like you're trying to be an authority figure but due to your own conduct or due to things out of your control uh, the audience thinks your performance is false and fake due to uh, misrepresentation that you want to try to avoid and then seventhly finally we have mystification so the concealment of certain information for the audience like i said it's something that you don't want to get out there um, you can kind of gloss over and conceal so as to avoid damaging your uh, reputation uh, in front of that audience.